Yes. Well, now that we're back, Joshua, I missed the hell out of you, buddy. Uh, it's going without recording with you for over a week has been something else. And um, I, I almost feel like it's not like therapy for me. It's kind of, and it's not like venting. It's like we're having conversations to mastermind a way of changing the reality of things for a lot of people. Uh, so it's not like just sitting there just blowing off steam. And it's not like, oh, thanks for hearing me out. It's more of listening to like-minded views and then seeing what, when somebody else says something that you think, it kind of opens up your mind a little bit more to go, well, hell, I've been so attracted to the issue that the solution now that I heard you say it is becoming more obvious versus if we were just doing it on our own and go, you know, at some point in time, you might find the solution. But hearing somebody else going through it sometimes repositions you in the conversation. And I feel like that's more of how our relationship is in this particular show. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's kind of how the universe works. Uh, we're going to get into one of the topics that kind of relates to this. But, you know, I heard the, the past two weeks that life is a one player game. And it, it is in a way, but we're all living life through our own perspective. And sometimes we can second guess our own perspective or we can get caught up in our own head. And one of the beautiful things about this show is that we, it's almost like you can articulate your thoughts in a manner to where you don't feel so alone in some ideas and maybe in some areas that uh, we're not so you know, in tune with how we feel, it can kind of come out in the show. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about life too. And it, I, it, it back to, again, to the original reason why Chad and I started the show. It's, you know, I just want to reiterate that waking the people is way more than just politics. It's, it's, it's waking the people to a variety of different topics and perspectives and, 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 and all the things that we go through in our lives that sometimes we have to deal with on our own in our own headspace and we can feel trapped and, and, you know, only I'm feeling this, but no, it's, it's, we're all going through this, Chad. You know, it's, I cannot believe I, I, a week, because I do remember that we recorded a week ago, but it has felt like much longer than a week. I thought it's been like an entire month since we've, we've done the episode. So welcome back to another episode of Waking the People. If you have not subscribed yet, please do so. We're still hovering at that magical 69 number. I would really appreciate it if you do watch our videos to hit that subscribe button, pound that bell, share, like, dislike, comment. Do all the good stuff. Um, so it's Friday night. Happy Friday, TGIF to everyone. I hate to do it, Chad. I'm sorry. There's still some yeah. left over. I and you got that homeopathic beer, man. You got to gotta get rid of it. You know, may as well just drink it. It's, it's going to hydrate you, you know, <laughs> because it's it's not real beer. It's just water. <laughs> it is just water. That's one of the beautiful things. You can just drink it. And again, I'm going to reiterate the price, you know, $12.99 for $18. No, twelve ninety nine for twenty four in the can, Chad. You can't beat it. We're in this time of inflation, or soon to be inflation. Gas prices, Chad. I've been driving a lot more just due to my current employment. And I tell you what, I'm I'm feeling it at the pump. Like I filled up. I've been filling up twice a week now. It used to be I could wow. fill up. I put twenty five bucks in that bad boy, and I could drive for you know fifteen days sometimes. And now, uh, uh-uh. uh. So oh. I got to pinch the pennies where I can. So yep. Homeopathic beer made in the USA. It's, it's here to stay for a little while, Chad. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. It, uh, one of the things that I had to do on my pro forma for the business that I, I, I'm starting up, actually not starting up, the business I started. So I'm um, doing the pro forma. I had to actually go through it. And, and if you're not familiar with what pro forma is the, for the, the viewers, it's when you put together an annual sales projection. And it so happens that the particular company that I'm creating or that I created uh, does not have a model to graph off of. It is a unique company. So uh, uh, we'll get, I'll talk more about it over time. But in my pro forma, I had to factor in mileage to gas. So actually how much it was going to cost me on a monthly basis for fuel just for traveling. And uh, it's, it's impressive, but not necessarily impressive in the desirable sense. But once you start factoring it in, because when you go to the pump and you put in, like right now, it takes me uh, 45 to $47 to fill my tank. Uh, And I have a four-cylinder. It's it's an Optima. 
No. So all the more reason to start looking at the electric vehicle market. So I'll just give you a little nudge, nudge, wink, wink to the, uh, to the viewers. And yeah, right. That was hardcore. It looked like a stroke wink. <laughs> But yeah, uh, keep following it. You'll find out more about it later on. I'll leave you a little cliffhanger on that. But yeah, it's it's an interesting thing because it has been a little while since we recorded, but not that long. And it does feel like it's been a lot longer. So glad to have you back, man. And this is something that I've really been looking forward to. Um, we do like intentionally, Joshua and I, to reiterate, we don't share our topics much. We'll talk, we'll say like, this is the topic category that we're going to talk about but we really don't get far into the details of it because we both really like to have that the the genuine and organic reaction about what we're actually going over like what we're discussing so um with our last guest I absolutely love the way she was organized she was awesome and i can't wait to get all of us on at the same time because i would love to have her on more frequently if you haven't caught that episode go to the last one to watch it um justine did amazing and i think the three of us and our personalities would be a great show in the future so we'll keep you posted on that one as it kind of uh, uh, occurs in the future but yeah so we're dealing with a lot of stuff right we got a lot of things going on what joshua and i are going to use today's episode for is to kind of catch up because we also haven't talked a lot in the last week and a couple of days uh so kind of catch up on things and then get into the subjects that we came prepared to chat about so, uh, Joshua, glad to have you back on and let's catch up a little bit, my man. So, yeah, so we started a new job. So just been kind of going through the trials and tribulations of doing something new. Um, not going to get into details of what the job is. If you know me personally, then you know what it is. Um, but I'll tell you what, Chad, I've learned a lot about change in the last two weeks and about how, you know, I talked earlier about perspective and how powerful perspective is and, I guess it's a good way to go back to the title of the show and that you have to be careful about how you pigeonhole yourself in life. Like we, uh, you know, no matter what it could be, you could think your limitations are, um, you know, in front of you and this is the best I can do and I can't do any better. Or, you know, you, you go to a job every day, you don't like, or et cetera. And, and the last two weeks, uh, it's been a big learning experience. I've learned a lot. Uh, time has been, uh, a valuable commodity, as you can tell. Uh, we haven't done as many episodes as we liked in the last two weeks due to both my and Chad's schedule. So um, it's been a beautiful experience, though. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's going to help the podcast as well, just due to what I'm going to be doing at the new job. And um, I'm really excited to see how it goes. I did watch the last episode. Justine said she, she did great. Um, it was very, um, it was fun to have kind of a different insight in the show. And I love all my plugs. Apparently, I was a transgender woman a couple times, and I had several different aliases that popped up in the show. So that was real cool, and uh, I appreciate the plugs. And but yeah, so um, if anyone's wondering, that's why I've been uh, kind of a little, uh, you know, MIA. I guess you could say is uh, just kind of going through my new schedule. And Chad and I start. What, what episode is this, Chad? Forty. Forty, baby. Yeah, we just 40. rounded okay. off. <laughs> Forty. Yeah. So. Uh, very different than when we first started the show, but um, as things start to settle, I think we'll start to come back to some kind of normalcy, and you'll see Chad and I post a lot more videos I know you guys like, but other than that, Chad, what about you? I mean, I haven't talked to you much at all in the last couple of weeks. Well, to kind of echo off of, or to kind of build a little bit more from your statement about uh, with us believing it like, okay, well, change is good, right? We have to be able to adapt. We've been told, the majority of us have been told through our life to become an expert at something, be a specialist at something. You know, you're told to go to college so that you can become some specialist of some particular field. But you've also been told in a negative cognition, it is negative light about you know, a jack of all trades is a master of none framed in a negative reference, right? You've heard it, right, Joshua? Absolutely. I've embraced that, but I also add a little bit more to it. A jack of all trades is a master of adaptation, but they adapt very well. And if you want to go to some sort of comical extreme, we'll say the zombie apocalypse occurs. Do you want the scientist that, you know, absolutely was the world leading expert of slug sexual habits? <laughs> I, 
Or do you want the guy that could actually build out or the girl, whatever, uh, that could build out, you know, a Jeep into this, you know, zombie slaying machine to protect you, you know, it's going to pull from a lawnmower and an old dryer and, you know, some, some of that breakfast that you didn't eat a week and a half ago. And it's just solidified enough that you can start killing shit with it. You know, like it's, <laughs> who do you want to actually be around you? Right. So I find that when we get into a position of isolation, we create more, we, we create more rigid thinking and, especially like one of the worst punishments that anybody could ever put you through is isolated confinement. You just stuck away from everybody. And all you have to do is just time to think about things. It's one of the worst punishments and actually is a fast lead to uh, mental health issues. So, because we're, we're community-based creatures, right? So if we isolate our thinking in such a way, you start losing other uh, particular traits, especially social cues, social interactions and behaviors. And then you can get into more of a territorial tribal defense mentality, which means your cortisol is going to go through the roof. It's going to affect your biochemistry, which causes, you know, the more your cortisols are elevated, the less you actually get uh, quality sleep because you get that from melatonin and melatonin and cortisol are competing hormones on opposite sides of each other. Uh, or I guess I didn't have to say opposite sides of each other. It's redundant they're opposite sides of the same coin. Cortisol wakes is a moving hormone. Melatonin is a sleep and recovery hormone. So if you don't get enough of both of them, it can cause problems. Most people are overstimulated. So when you get into these isolated thinking categories where you just think in a narrow viewpoint, your stress levels go up because your arguments go up. You find more arguments instead of fewer. And I find that a lot of times it's not the environment we're in. It's how we think about our environment that creates us so many problems. Because if you can't adapt to that environment, the environment disagrees with you more. But if you can adapt with it, you agree with it more in such a way that you can master it. But if not, you're trying to force your environment to fit your view. And we're not that kind of godly creature. Now, we can manipulate our environment, but we have limitations to it. It's better that we adapt to our environment. So... With all of those things being said, it has been one of the things like, so since I would left my last job, I have focused completely on two different avenues. One is my real estate license, which if you know me, you know, I've been working on that. Um, and the other side is the business that I've been working on. And with those two things, I have gotten to the point where I'm almost obsessed on a daily basis. I am dug deep in research so that I could produce the best of both worlds in that. So I, one has a very sense, actually both of them have sensitive timelines. I can't abandon one for the other. Just, I can't do that right now. I've got one side, I have an entire team of people working with me to build it out. Again, that's a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Now, just know it has to do with electrical vehicles. <laughs> and we will talk about them more as the show goes on over time. Uh, and on the other side, I've got one of my best friends in the world, you know, and it's like, he's a great mentor and he's helping me on the other side with the real estate. So adapting to the situation and being fluid enough in my thinking that I can easily go from one subject to another in such a way that I retain as much as possible, but I also have not allowed any of my relationships to suffer. So it's been going through a lot. Um, it's, you may notice it in some of the shows, you may not. Uh, it's not so much emotion other than if anything, I'm like more excited on average than I had been in years. But the other side is I'm also mentally drained because I've got so much time that I'm absorbing with that energy. So uh, now with that, that kind of catches us up a bit, you know, because it's, this has been a major focus of mine now, but on the other side of it for another subject that I actually want to get into is uh, somebody that I sought out because uh, I really cherished his teaching and I, I cherished it for a long time. I went through a couple of years where I was consuming a lot of his work. And Joshua mentioned him earlier before the show started. Uh, and that's Mr. Alan Watts. If you're not familiar with Alan Watts, I'm not saying become a devotee. That's something that I caution myself against in my life. I don't want to be a devotee to anybody other than the life that I'm creating. But I don't, I really do enjoy learning from everybody. Now with that, Alan Watts is fantastic. Joshua was recently introduced to him. Um, 
his body of work is he does, he teaches this perspective. It's like in a Western entire um, Western enlightenment pulled from Eastern enlightenment and made in such a way that we in the West are capable of consuming it and not looking at it like it's so far away from our real or our world experience that we look at it and say, well, that's just something for somebody else. Because that's one of the problems with Western thinking against Eastern and vice versa, um, that we can get to a point where we're like, well, that's too far-fetched, that's too uh, cerebral, or that's too esoteric, or uh, far too spiritual for my, my beliefs. And it kind of becomes off-putting. But the way that Alan Watts talked about it uh, was one that you can wrap, you could logically understand it and get a sensation, uh, a feeling of change inside of you, because it, it opens up categories of thinking for areas you may have closed off and thought to yourself, well, that's done. That's the event. And therefore, I'm never going to visit it again because I don't want to emotionally revisit that. So, uh, but I don't want to dominate this conversation at the moment with Alan Watts because I've got years of study on him. Joshua is new to him. And I really like the excitement when somebody gets his work, especially in the beginning stages of it. So Joshua, do you mind talking a little bit about that? Absolutely. I, I, there's two perspectives of his that I really like. One is he talks about, and this is, I'm, I'm as Chad said, I, I'm very much a newbie in his work. I'm only like a couple weeks in. Um, but I like his, number one, I like his perspective on, um, the, it, it, it's called Life is a Dream. And how he said how, you know, if you could go to sleep at night and you could dream the perfect life, let's say for 75 years, and you could have every experience you could possibly want, every pleasure, and uh, you wake up and be like, wow, you know, that, that was great. That was awesome. And then he talks to, okay, well, why don't you dream a dream where uh, you don't get a choice as far as the experiences you have and the situations in your life and, 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 you know, random things happen to you. You don't have control like you did in the dream to where, you know, every experience you could ever have, you could have. And he was like, well, you know, if, if you had that ability to dream a dream where things happen to you and you had no control and things happen the way they are, well, guess what? You would dream the very life that you're having currently. And it's it was a cool way to, to kind of articulate a lot of, I guess, negative things that a lot of people see in life, like the things that are uncontrollable. but Part of the beauty of life is that, um, you know, you, you can't have death without life and you can't have life without death. They're very connected with one another. And once you can understand that, it really changes your perspective. And I guess his, his dream theory was, you know, hey, you don't have control over your life. And the fact that you know you're going to die one day and you know that you're uh, currently alive then it, you can kind of see the beauty of the world. And I really liked that, uh, that, that theory. And there's one more that I really enjoyed, which is what he said. You know, we all think we're the center of the universe, all of us. And, you know, we've been told our whole lives by society and people that, you know, we're not the center of the universe. But I liked, I liked how he articulated this, um, uh, th this, this theory. And uh, imagine, a, like, if you have a ball, right? If you have, like, a... A, a circular ball, a glass ball, and someone asked you to say, hey, what's the, the center point of that ball? You, it would be all of it, right? It'd all be the center point of the ball, and that's kind of what life is. I mean, we all play a role in this universe, and nothing happens by chance, and no matter how you look at the ball, every point of the ball can be the center, and that's essentially what we are, and then I thought about, well, wait a second. We're on Earth. That's a sphere. It's a ball. So I, I, I liked, I haven't really dug much deeper than that into the ball theory, but I really liked how he could shape the fact that you, you are not the center of the universe, but at the same time you are, and everyone has a role they play. It, it, it really gave, even if you're in a position in the life where you're not really happy with what you're doing, it, it gave you, um, I guess you could say like a reiteration of you are contributing to the universe, no matter what you're doing. And in some way or in some view, you are the center of that universe. And I, I, I really liked that. That was a very comforting theory. Yeah. Well, I'll add a couple of things to it too. You know, you've heard of the term, the butterfly effect, right? Yes. 
And for people that aren't familiar with it, the butterfly effect is an effect that they talk about for time travel. And if, if you were capable of time travel into the past, any and everything you would do, including the potential of stepping on a butterfly uh, or the, the, a, the, the butterfly's wing flapping, just the nature of it uh, flapping or, or moving in a direction that was different than the actual past changes the trajectory of the future and how that could change it from the most microscopic insignificant value to something significant. That's what the whole concept of the butterfly effect is. Now, obviously in the comment section, if I'm off by anything or you have your own interpretation of it, please put it down there. Um, but so what we do is we look at that in hindsight as a way of trying to get people to be more present to their moment without necessarily stating, pay attention to what you do now. So if I could go with you on this one is to think, what is the thought you just now have? Like, what's your next action? All right, so Joshua, after we finish recording, what's your next action? Now, when you get up to walk away from the screen, are you going to walk to the right or the left of the screen? Hmm, probably the right, normally. Okay, but if you walk to the left, would it be a little bit different than normal? Yeah. What if you walk to the left and you stub your toe, creating such an injury that's going to cause you to limp, and you find out tomorrow you have a friend that calls up and says, hey, let's go out for a run. You're like, well, I stubbed my toe last night. My foot's uncomfortable and I don't think it's a good idea. So if something so insignificant as you decide to walk to the left instead of the right from leaving the, or the, the, the screen, you could end up doing something that would cause you to change your trajectory tomorrow. As simple as that is, but let's look longer term. So just substance value. The, again, just a thought experiment, right? Substance value. Your friend is continuing on the same example. Your friend has said, okay, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go run anyway. And now your friend goes out for a run. And this is a, let's say it's a male friend of yours. And he goes for a run. And normally if you had actually gone with him, you would have had your normal stretch out. You would have went to your normal running place. Uh, whatever, what normal is for you and him. It could be once a month or once every other week, something like that, right? Well, then he goes on his own, he does his stretch out routine. He pops on the music, decides he's going to listen to something different than what he does when he's with you or listen to music when he doesn't. And he decides to run a certain direction. Well, let's say that he runs in a certain direction. He crossed path with somebody he finds very attractive that also finds him attractive. They're both single or not, doesn't matter. But you can see how this can build onto itself, right? Mm -hmm. And these very small, insignificant values can change the trajectory of a future that you decide in the present, but we're convicted by our past. And we're convicted by our past based off of the experiences that we've had that we say, I'll never want to have again. And the experiences that we've had, you're like, I want to have that again. And the experiences that you've had once or twice, you're like, if only that could happen again. Uh, like, so we lose choice because of those convictions. And then it changes the direction of our future. Now, it's not a bad thing. It just starts to create a likely more, uh, more of a um, predictable future when you live with, I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing that again. I want to do this again. And you start narrowing down your thinking process and patterns in life so that you're like, okay, well, I'm going to go fishing tomorrow. And you're like, I don't fish. I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, so, but you might have been open to it had you gone fishing with maybe your dad once or twice more. Right. Or you had a friend that you two bonded that way. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that would be nice and nostalgic and, and get out there. And the next thing you know, you have a day where your cortisol levels are lower and your, you know, your relaxation, your ability to meditate in the moment. Yeah. They love doing this when they hear me talk. They love it. I don't know if you can hear them out there fighting. They're doing some Greco dog wrestling right now. Um, but you see the thought experiment on this is, is it's, it, you can, if you wanted to point at right now, you can be a victim of your past that's locking yourself into the present that limits your future. And that's one of the factors that uh, Alan Watts is talking about when he talks about the sphere, right? The glass ball. Um, it's, he called it a glass ball, not a crystal ball, because he didn't want you to think projecting and, and seeing the future, right? But the glass ball. And the truth of it is, is the mass is the whole, it's spherical, the center point is hard to see because you're looking through something and you cannot have a distinction that says that moment, that speck, that fragment is the center. 
So by the way, we apologize for pissing off our flat earthers if there is any, or if we're going after those people because we talked about earth being a sphere, but you know, that's the science, that's the kind of science I like. Um, <laughs> the kind that we can get observable. But anyway, uh, so with this thought experiment, is this, um, are you kind of, are you following with me there? Oh uh, yeah, Joshua? It's, it's, it's making me rethink how I do things in my certain life that seem minuscule and seem routine, but sometimes that very routine that you think is the proper way to do things can actually be deterring or uh, closing you off to certain experiences that you're going to have later on in life. I really like it. I, I And I guess it, it's a good point to prove that, um, again, why we did the show. You know, I saw the crystal ball in the way of, oh, it is, uh, or the, the the crystal ball, here I am. See, look, I can learn something every day. <laughs> the, gla the glass ball is just a metaphor to, to show how, you know, everyone is the center of the universe, but can actually show you that, you know, the choices you make today, even how minuscule they may seem in the very moment, can actually have big impacts later on in the future. And it kind of reiterates something that I tell people a lot, and that is little by little will go far. It's a it's a J.R. Tolkien quote that I really, really like. And yeah, uh, I like it. I'm sure, I mean, if, if, if there's viewers out there and you like this, you know, like Chad said, leave a comment. Leave something that maybe you learned from this experience or this talk. Uh, and honestly, Chad, I want to have more of these talks on the show. I think that they're super important and, again, waking people up to different ideas. And I, I see, um, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chad, but some people that are more in the, the faith, of the, you know, the, whether it be Christian or Muslim or different religions, um, they kind of have a lot of negative things to say about Alan Watts. And I don't know necessarily if he was trying to say negative things about religion. He was just trying, he actually even talked about how, you know, uh, people, you know, we've been brought up since we were younger to realize that, hey, you're not the center of the universe. You have to go there and contribute. And to say how the last, but yet every main religion has one center figure that is the center of the universe. But at the same time, all of them were completely, you know, criticized and, you know, Jesus was crucified because they said they were the center of the universe. So it, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, I like them a lot. Yeah. And well, let's do another a little thought experiment too. And it's not so much, actually, it's more of just substance instead of necessarily a thought experiment. And it's cost benefit. You're gonna, like I'd mentioned earlier, you have people that they do the same thing that puts them into predictable patterns. There's a benefit to being predictable. It's easier to stabilize relationships when you're predictable. It is not as easy to stabilize relationships when you're unpredictable. Right? Because people like to understand patterns of predictability so they know how to engage with that person and to create a different life experience, create a controlled life experience. Because if you have two people that are in a fixed pattern of behavior that they align well with each other, we typically call it chemistry in relationships. It's a factor of chemistry. It's not the entirety of chemistry. It's a factor. And like with your relationships that you've had in your life, Joshua, I'm sure that you've looked where you have similarities, life experiences that you guys have um, exchanged conversations to recognize you have experienced something very similar. And you're like, okay, well, I've gone through that too. And you feel like this rapport scale going up because you're like, hell, we've done this. I've gone through that. You went through that, right? Simon Sinek talks about this too. You can be in the exact same town and you run across somebody you know, and they, you don't give a damn. But if you're over in another country and you happen to be on a train and they say, hey, I'm from the U.S. And you're like, hey, me too. What town or what's where are you from? And they say, you know, your hometown. You're like, really? And then all of a sudden you feel like you're connected. Right? So Simon Sinek talks about that because it does have factors in psychology and it, across the board, this all does. But when you have predictability, you can start to have relationships that they connect with each other in such a way that they're more solidified. Because if you're always doing something different, doesn't mean that you're not desirable. You can look, you can be sought out as being, or saw, uh, you can be perceived to be a free spirit. The thing about it is though, is that you may also not look like you're as responsible. Uh, you see, there's the cost benefit thing. I'm not saying because you're a free spirit, you're not responsible. I'm not saying that. People love to work in the world of absolutes and to try to, 
conjure up the idea of what you're saying based off the words you've chosen and their life experiences, not what they're, they're not less necessarily listening to you the entire time. So cost benefits. If you have somebody who has a life where they're regularly unhappy, that's when it's a great exercise to explore into different patterns of behavior, considering that same scenario. You've watched the movie Yes Man with uh, Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. Remember how he like he started saying yes to stuff, and in the beginning it was a little scary, and then it was exciting, and then it became like he got addicted, and then he got a high from it, and then all of a sudden his life is completely different, right? And he found the love of his life and all the rest of this stuff. That happens. But whenever you get your ideology becomes so rigid that you start expelling people from your life because you cherish the ideology more than you cherish, uh, cherish relationships, that's when problems start to occur. And that's one of the things that, uh, that Alan Wallace was talking about is that when he talks about you are the center instead of you need to give up, uh, it, it, like the whole idea about like some religions is like the center is Jesus or Muhammad or, you know, like you, you go to the, the figures, right? Moses, uh, whomever it is, that's like the centerpiece. Uh, well, now you have more responsibility in your life and you don't need to follow and worship everyone else as much as you need to worship yourself. And that was one of his big points. He's not worship yourself into the world of narcissism. It's worship yourself in the world of balance. And there's a big difference. But if you don't study his work or if you don't understand how to create balance in your life, it can become a very selfish act. Now, there is a such thing as healthy selfish, and then there's unhealthy selfish. And concepts of healthy selfish is, Joshua, you want to go out drinking with me tonight? And you're like, you know what? I need to give my liver a break. I want to lose a little bit of weight. And I got to get up for my clients early tomorrow. And you say, no, that's you being selfish because you're taking away your time with me, right? Because my attachment looking at you is, I want you out there hanging out with me, buddy. I got shots to drink. I'm going to listen to some tea pain, you know, like <laughs> the sweat drip off, right? All that, right? And I'm going to look at it and be like, man, Josh, well, come on. I could perceive that as you being selfish. You would perceive it as being responsible and healthy selfish often is being responsible, but you have to understand how to do it because if you get accused of being selfish and you're not mentally prepared for that accusation, there's a good chance that you're going to reevaluate your behavior in such a way that you may be like, you know what, maybe I was being a joke to you or a jerk to you. And, and I'm sorry for that. Never say sorry unless you're on un the only time you should say I'm sorry without placating is when you truly didn't mean it and you intend on changing that behavior. But there's a lot of people that just say I'm sorry so that they don't have to deal with the consequences of your upset at that moment. So, I, by the way, this is a conversation and this type of conversation has not been going on a lot in my life lately. So it's nice to revive it because I do have a very deep spiritual center, but my spirituality isn't what most people understand Orthodox religion to look like. So, uh, and, and as most people that watch this, if you've watched all of our episodes beginning to end, you know that I'm atheist, but I'm kind of not. I, it's an interesting dichotomy. So I'm more of a Jefferson's Christian, if you will. But anyway, all right, all that aside, cost benefits. Is it worth you right now, Joshua, for the pattern of behavior you have for the said goal of what your future is to be? Is it worth you changing your behaviors now from a method that you know will get you there to potentially try a method that may not be tried and true and could derail you? And is it worth that to you? Hmm. And that's way, where, yeah. In some ways, uh, obviously, you know, if it's the old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it, but you don't know what you don't know. So it's always good to experiment with different patterns and different behaviors, a different way of looking at things. So I'm, I'm very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I, I am passive, but I'm also aggressive in the sense of behaviors. So I can be quite spontaneous at times. And I can also be quite, you know, you know, passive at times. So I think it's a good balance of both. But to answer your question, um, I think there are definitely some areas of my life, and I'm sure all of our listeners can agree that there's certain patterns that we're in that we should probably either try to find different mechanisms or different behaviors that could fix those patterns that might project us into a better way. 
And at the same time, maybe there's some patterns that we have in our life that we should probably cut out that are limiting us in some way that are not putting us where we need to be. So, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy these topics, Chad. This is, this is something that uh, I think a lot of people, just based on our society, based on how um, a lot of people live their lives, they don't necessarily have, I don't want to say time. They, um, they're kind of in that uh, don't know, don't care mindset. That they really don't want to, so look, even, even Athena agrees, that uh, yeah, you know, right. it's, good to, it's good to look at things differently. And it's always good to check yourself and to see different mindsets and see different perspectives because you have no idea what that can cause in your life. And five years down the road, because of this little thing that you change, your whole life could be uh, completely different. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So I, I'm, I'm going to start looking into more of his work. And I, I think you guys will, will see a little bit more of the psychology. It's, it's honestly, it's one of my favorite topics to think about. If I can go back in time, the butterfly effect, if I can go back in time, I would probably major in psychology if I could, because it's so fascinating. It's just, it's completely endless in so many different ways. And uh, yeah, so, you know, look for that in the future. And Chad is, is very, very educated in this topic. So he oh. is educating me just like you guys at the same time. So I enjoy it. It, it. It's healthy. I mean, we live in a life that's so nine to five, do, 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 get home, rest, repeat. And it's good to break out of that pat pattern cycle and to create different mindsets that you necessarily wouldn't see in your everyday, you know, life or, you know, however you interact with people. It, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, Chad. I like it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joshua. I wasn't yeah, expecting yeah. a compliment from you this evening. Uh, I know. All right. I, I want to touch on one more thing, actually two more things, and then we'll move on to the next subject. Because I go from being this nice, enlightened sounding guy to being um, frustrated <laughs> about the outlining hypocrisy. Uh, but I, I do want to mention uh, when you are making changes, I'm not saying if you like the way your life is going, don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. You never know because you can tweak things. What I would suggest is just like if you want to become more financially responsible, you keep a ledger. You track your spending. You look at your your total uh, potential, what money you have coming in, money going out, and what your if you have a savings option or if you're investing someplace, how to keep yourself well balanced. Well, if you look at the your satisfaction level, and if I were to say, okay, on a scale of one to a hundred, how satisfied are you in life overall? Now, not specific in one area, just overall satisfied in life. Now, on a concept of not really content but happiness oh so then from there on that scale where would you put yourself so hypothetically we'll say joshua's at like 90 percent happy hypothetically it's not his answer but this is just a hypothetical and joshua says i'm 90 percent happy well that means he's 10 percent unhappy so now we can talk about areas that he's unhappy in now those areas now again this is not therapy although i'm sure therapists use this method um i'm not though <laughs> I'm just using it for change, uh, uh, options for change. Um, uh, is you look at those areas that you're dissatisfied in, and from there, on a scale of one to a hundred, again, what level of satisfaction do you find in that area regularly, so that you can scale that? Okay, well, um, you know, ten percent of the time I'm unhappy. Now, of that ten percent of the time, I broke it down into categories of what I'm unhappy about. And you start creating these itemized concepts about what makes you dissatisfied in life. Now, from there, when you are in those categories, what's your satisfaction in life percentage at that point, once you've narrowed it down to put it into a specific focus. Now, as you continue to do this, you're creating these different categories with percentages. I will venture to say that if you're really going to be honest with yourself, when you get these categories, you're not going to say, I am 0% satisfied in every one of those categories because they fall into the dissatisfied category. You'll find that you do have satisfaction at times in that because dissatisfaction can be a, 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 per, um, a gauge for you to recognize that something is not going the way you want it to, but you do still enjoy having factors here, have faculties or abilities or time span or whatever it is, you still like that, time, that, that place to a degree. Now, you may find that it is a necessary evil, right? Eat your vegetables before you get dessert, right? Not that vegetables are, I don't want to piss off the vegans, right? <laughs> or or the, 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 their ilk, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if you listen to a kid, that's usually the language they use. So 
what you do is you're creating these categories you can take action on. And you can start to revisit that category in such a way that as soon as you pull off the veil of emotional decision, and the veil of an emotional decision is what you've categorized and cauterized that thing to become. You categorize that I don't like that. And then you say, I'm not going to visit it again, or I'm going to limit my exposure to that thing, or I'll go off into my happy place, la la land, when that thing comes up, which means that you've encapsulated the negative and you can't do much with it until you pull the veil off. And now you look back at it and say, you know what, when that event happened or the series of events happened, if you can get back to a core of that event, like the first time it happened or the most major impact it had on you, let's say somebody came in and they slapped you right across the face for something you didn't do. Right. But you decided at that moment, that particular person is somebody you never want to be involved with again. You don't want to be around that person or anything. Once you lock that in time and the emotional veil, you lock it away into, as a capsule. And now you say, I'm not going to be around that person again. You're not free of that person. You're not free of that person for that person. You're also not free of that person for the characteristics that are resembled in other people. So whenever something comes up that reminds you of that person instantaneously, emotionally, you can transition into, I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied. I don't want to be around this person, but this person does not have that history, but they have a characteristic that reminds you of that person could be a, very, a stronger characteristic that was actually involved in the moment that made that thing happen to your awareness. But when you pull that veil off, instead of living your life by this maze of, I just don't want to experience this person again, go back and say, you know what, let me revisit it. How did I feel going into that moment? Was I well rested? Was I hungry? Did I feel emotionally balanced and well? Did I feel excited about something or was I depressed and upset? What was the temperature in the room that I was in? Was it a hot, sunny day? Was it cold? What kind of clothes were, was I wearing? How did I feel about myself with the clothes I was wearing? How did I feel about my haircut? Did I feel like my facial hair was right? Did I feel like that person that I was interacting with had a relationship with me that I had an expectation? They were going to give me something at that moment that was going to match what I expected of that person. And then they surprised me with this, pow, and it hurt. And the person said a few choice words that dug deep. Then the veil goes over and you're gone. And the rest of your life, you're like, eh, people like that. I don't know why. I just don't like them. The really reality is you don't know why because you didn't think about it and put the effort into like figuring it out. So that happens. Why I brought all of that tangent up is it brings us back to the percentage of change. That is an exercise to help re it, it's an exercise to recreate something in such a way that you can leave that memory. You can take that memory to new places and you can say, you know what, maybe I do forgive that person. But because I created such an emotional cocoon around it, I wasn't allowing it. And I was still dealing with it 10, 20, 30 years later. But now I forgive the person and you all of a sudden feel the sense of relief. Christianity teaches forgiveness. Psychology tries to teach people forgiveness, at least a good psychologist anyway. Uh, so now we get to percentages. If you're 90% of the time, you're satisfied, 10% not. Well, you get 10% of an area to tinker with. You can use that thought exercise. You can use that exercise to try to figure something out. Or you can say, you know what? I haven't hang glided before. If, if my level of satisfaction in life has to do that, I don't feel like I've experienced enough in life. I don't get enough thrill. Well, when's the last time you did something thrilling? Oh, it was when you ran through that yellow light and you noticed that it turned red just <laughs> as your windshield was right there. Is that the last thrill you got? And then looking back going, is there a traffic camera back there? Shit, right? <laughs> or was it when you were like, you know what? It, you could come up with so many different examples. You know, I, I'm just going to give an example that might deter away from it. But the, the point is, is that if that's your thing, well, you got 10% allowance to work on it. And what that means is you give yourself out of the week, you have seven days out of the week. doesn't mean give an entire day. But of the actions necessary to keep you satisfied 90% of the time, don't abandon those, those actions. Keep them going. You need them because they're, they're maintaining a pretty decent amount of satisfaction. 
But for the 10%, now it's time to look at what can we do to create a little bit more excitement in life, a little more adventure. And then you go, okay, well, you start looking at what would give you that sense of satisfaction, that sense of excitement, and then build it into part of your life in such a way that you have your, you give yourself your playtime. So, all right. I went on a long tangent and you have been a very patient man. And I think part of the area of your dissatisfaction is when I tangent. <laughs> that was good. It was good. Yeah. All, I mean, all good. It's all good stuff. So with that being said, we're going to move into one of our, uh, I guess what second topic, Chad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's probably our last topic today too. This is a good one. This is the one that I think it's going to be very interesting. And on the um, on the surface, it looks very uh, you know benign. I guess you could say, kind of like irrelevant to most people. But this is the cruise industry, Chad. I think I, I told you about this earlier. The cruise industry. Now, it's been pushed back. You know, so many different times they're supposed to go off in October and then November and then December. And now we're in August is when the cruise industry is supposed to, you know, finally set sail again. And there's been a lot of pushbacks on several different fronts as far as the cruises. There's been, you know, the state of Florida that's suing the, uh, the CDC as far as not allowing, you know, the cruises to set sail. Now, Chad, we even have cruise lines suing Florida because they're not allowing certain passengers on cruises based on the vaccines. Um, it, it's, it's, and so I, you know, I'm a numbers guy. I think I've said on the show multiple times, I like the numbers. So in between uh, 2017 and uh, 2019, the cruise industry, um, I think this particular number was just Norwegian cruise lines. Actually, no, I take that back. I just realized it was not. Uh, it was the majority of cruise lines made about, uh, I want to say around $2.7 billion within 2017, 2019. Now, I could be wrong on my numbers, um, but it, it's about that as far as total revenue between those years. Now, just in the last year and a half, Chad, the cruise industry has lost $12 billion in, in overall revenue. I mean, they have, they have no revenue. So th th there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. Number one, the people that are actually being hurt by this are middle to lower class people. And I'm not saying that people that go on cruises are you know, mid to lower class. What I'm saying is the cruise industry, as far as part of the travel industry umbrella, gives people a, a really good opportunity to go out and see the world for a relatively low price. Some of these cruises are seven days. They're all inclusive. Room and board is, is, is included. You know, Drink packages, food, you don't have to worry about a lot of things. You get to go to multiple different countries and it gives people a, a great opportunity to go and see the world when they necessarily wouldn't have the funds to do so. Let's say if they wanted to you know, fly or, or travel in other manners. So it's, I'm seeing both sides to this chat. I'm seeing you know, that the big gripe right now is, is in particular is Norwegian Cruise Lines who is you know, currently you know, in the process of suing the state of Florida because um, of the, 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 the vaccine limitations. This, you know, so Florida is not mandating um, uh, the cruises to have vaccinated pastors come on the cruises in order to set sail, which I understand. You know, as Chad and I have said, or at least me, I'm probably more on the libertarian side. I think that people should be able to do whatever they want, get vaccinated, not get vaccinated, doesn't matter. But at the same time, I also see the standpoint of the cruise line say, listen, guys, we're losing billions of dollars, billions. And if we can set sail, and if, if, if one of the big benefactors or one of the big factors in order for us to go and make money again is allowing vaccinated passengers to come on our boats, then let them, then let let us do it. You know, because it's it, it's a double edged sword here, and I don't want to go off on my own tangent, but you know, the, the only the, the big the, the one of the big things that could happen is, is you could see the cruise industry leave the state of Florida. Now, Chad and I are both Floridians, so I want to see my state flourish. But at the same time, I don't want to see a, a, a massive industry in our state leave based on certain you know, policies. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not one for the other, but it, it's kind of an interesting topic because I'm, I'm seeing both sides of the argument. You know what I mean? Yeah, so... Clarify for me real quick. They're saying that the state of Florida says that 
they're not allowing people that are vaccinated so, to get on the ships or they're not the because group. last I knew about it was that cruise lines wanted the mandatory, like they wanted yes. mandatory vaccine passports. If you wanted to take a cruise, you had to have the passport. You yes. were not yes. going to get exceptions. And the state of Florida says it's unconstitutional. You are not doing that here. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Uh, so that's the way I understood it. I'm sorry. I misheard it. And yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good. I probably didn't articulate it right. But yeah. So the region is saying, hey, listen, we want to make money. Okay. And we are dying financially. If it means that, hey, we can only accept vaccinated passengers, then let us do it. But because of the laws that Florida has put in, as far as not mandating the vaccine passports, it's almost like it's a double-edged sword. Obviously, I don't want to see anything mandated for certain people. But at the same time, this giant industry that brings a lot of money to our state is suffering and possibly could yeah. leave the state because well, here's, of that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing with it. All they have to do is say, you know what, let the economy sort itself out. If the people that are vaccinated don't want to be around the people that don't want to get the vaccine, that's their choice not to get on that cruise ship. So, and if the cruise ship, by the way, if you get vaccinated, that means that you're supposed to be in a better position to fight this virus off in the event that you come across it. But for people that are unvaccinated, it doesn't, it's like their immune system is going to do what their immune system has to do in order to deal with this thing. So what Norwegian is saying though, is that the only way you're gonna be able to take part of this thing is if you get the vaccine. So what they're doing is it's not just commerce, it's coercion. If you want this thing, you need to get your, this done. And if not, you're not doing it. Now, I'm a big proponent. If Norwegian wants to run their business that way, I don't give a shit. Let them run their business that way. I don't want to get on that ship. I don't want to be on that cruise line. If they're going to mandate something like that to me, it is unconstitutional. You have no right to my medical history. None. HIPAA, right? My medical history is my information. And for me to have that vaccine passport is a violation of HIPAA, especially for something that's 0.6. I, you know, point six people. So if you don't want to get on that cruise ship, let that cruise ship take its hit because it will. How many people are going to say, screw it. I'm not going to go cruise here. And then let's say carnival example. It's not saying that they did it, but let's say, you know what? Carnival opens up and says, I don't give a shit. Come on in. Let's go. <laughs> get your drink card and everything else. We're going to have a damn good time right now. People that are double shot and triple shot are still catching it. They're doing okay for the most part. It's the, I, anyway, I'm not going to get into the rest of it because one, the video could get taken down. And two is there's still enough nut jobs out there. Be like, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. I'd be like, what am I, a fucking fortune teller? Is that why you're calling me that? Anyway, so it's not a, it's not a crystal ball. It's a glass sphere. <laughs> But you see my point, right? Like, I, I see both sides of this. I see Norwegian's standpoint. That, listen, we got to make money. And my biggest thing is I don't want to see Norwegian leave our ports. I want to see more money, more tourism dollars being spent in our state. Because as we all know, tourism is a giant economic boost for this state. So I really hope that we can find some kind of middle ground. Um, again, I think that the travel industry is, you know, it's going to hopefully continue to increase as, you know, uh, some, some, you know, lockdowns are lifted, but I, I see both sides of this argument and I personally don't know what the best solution to this is, uh, but I guess time will tell, but I'm hoping that some of this doesn't cause, you know, more economic problems to not, I mean, predominantly in this case, it's going to be Florida because we are, you know, a heavy, you know, tourism and cruises and all the, all the good stuff that we provide people. But I don't want to see that echo into other areas of our country. Uh, it, it's and and I don't know. I don't know, Chad. I really don't. I, I just looked at this from a kind of ver very bird's eye view. And again, I want to say that it may seem very minuscule. As oh, cruises. I don't cruise anyway. Well, it, it's a it's a big pull factor. Uh, it's a lot of people come here from a lot of different states, countries, etc., to come to our state to go either go to the music parks that we offer all the different travel and, and, and leisure experiences that state that this state offers the world. 
I don't want to see that, you know, start to crumble because of, you know, certain things. But at the same time, I don't want to see things pushed upon people that they don't necessarily want or feel is necessary. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a freaking pickle, Chad. Well, and my thing is looking at it beyond that. It's just like any legal case. Once a legal decision is made, it sets a precedent. So let's say Norwegian wins and Florida loses. Now, how many companies are going to be like, you know what? We're following suit. And now we create this, you do as we say, or you don't have rights to this. Now, Florida standing in your constitutional right, and they're running the risk of losing revenue. I am curious to what the tourism, the, the cruise line industry pays the state of Florida in taxes, because it's not every business is built the same. If it's under maritime law and, and they have a tax value that's associated with that, I don't know. I'm not an expert here at all. I'm looking for the details to find out. Right? So if they decide to take their, themselves to another port, okay, I'm a capitalist in the way that, okay, who's going to fill the void? You get another one of those cruise lines that will be like, you know what? I'd love to have more ship room and, and be able to put more ships in their port. Hell yes. And then you're like, well, I like Norwegian. Fantastic. Go on up to, I don't know, New York City to get on your Norwegian ship. Mm -hmm. You know, fantastic. Go there. Fine. Catch a flight. Go do that whole thing. Do like the Texas Democrats and don't wear a mask and get your cores light up there and then come back with three cases or five cases of Rona. No. <laughs> it's true. It's a great it's, but, it's a great point too. It's it's if you know, let's say Norwegian left, you know, I'm sure Royal Caribbean or or some of the other cruise lines would love to fill those empty ports because I, again, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm sure you know if it's anything like other travel industries, they don't own those ports. They pay whether it be a lease or some kind of a fee monthly to run out of those ports. And you know, if, if it can increase, you know, other cruise lines revenue to run out of those ports that the region has pulled out, then by all means. And again, you know, Chad, something we haven't talked about that involves this is that all the other countries that these cruise lines go to that, you know, are benefit from tourism going there, whether it be the Bahamas, Virgin Islands, Mexico, these are, you know, that they make their money based on that travel. You know, us Americans, we love to get on these cruise lines and go and buy these hundred dollar necklaces that someone, you know, just made up, you know, but hey, that's, it will make the world go round. So the same, yeah, it's, 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 it's so, again, it, I guess it can kind of relate to what we were talking about now is the, the, the butterfly effect, how these little things can affect so many different things around the world. And yeah, I mean, the, the cruise line is no, or the cruise industry is no different. Yeah. Well, think about this too. Let's say they got their way of Florida and then Disneyland decides to do it. And then Disneyland and then Universal, you know, if you don't want to go to get a vaccine and you just want to live your life and have natural immunity against something, then by, you know, you, you're like, now you can't go to Universal and you can't go to Disneyland. The precedence has been uh, set because Norwegian won the, ca the case, right? If that be the case, you know, and if they lose the case, they get their happy ass out of Florida and they go to another state, set up business there, which is going to actually let them run it that, that way. And they won't stop at Florida or any properties owned by territories of Florida. So like, you know, the state of Florida is pretty much whatever, but any, you know, the territory itself. But what about where they go to the ports they go to? Are they going to rope it off where the only people that they're allowed to interact with is people that are vaccinated? Yeah, it's a good question. So they're going to say, okay, well, we're not going to go to Mexico until all of Mexico is vaccinated, or we're not going to go unless Cozumel itself and every resident there is, or wherever you can go, you got like, you know, roped off areas where you're like, yeah, you can go right over here and enjoy yourself. There's about four and a half feet of uh, some beach over there with two lawn chairs that you got to wipe down 15 times. Go, go enjoy that. So, so there's more consequences to it. So, but the reality of it is because of the way that our, our economy is structured, they take their ships out, somebody else will fill the void. And if all of them take themselves out, then the next billionaire is going to be like, you know what? I'm going to make a couple of ships and start my own cruise line that says, I don't give a shit. I'm going to give you what you want. And I'm not going to put my, you know, mandated requirements and restrictions on you. It's true. Because it does. It's, it's, that's how the legal cases work too. Whenever yeah. you set a precedence, then you can argue that precedence into specific cases. 
you know, and you can win those cases based off of the previous precedents. So yeah, just things to be careful for. It sounds like on the surface, the argument is, you know, it's kind of like you, you find yourself 50, 50, right in the middle. And for me, I'm like, buy Norwegian, mm-hmm. buy Felicia, you mm-hmm. get your ships, pack them on up. You're going to make a big fuss, you know, Royal Caribbean or, you know, Disney cruise line or whatever, whoever else wants to follow suit. We're, we are the state where people are moving into in droves for a reason. So decades. And I think our economy is shifting as well. We've been a very tourist driven economy. We still did great during the lockdowns. We're one of the only states that actually did awesome, you know, with us being predominant, predominantly uh, tourist based. We didn't need federal bailout money like some other shitty states. So, because they're run by absolute, yeah, oh God, morons. You know, I, no, I won't say morons. I just say evil people. So, but yeah, that's where I'm at with the, the cruise line thing. And I know it's, it's like, it's a healthy disagreement though, because not, it's not going to affect our relationship at all. And I see that how you see it too, as far as the difference, you know, you can see both sides. And for me, I'm on the side going, I don't care what Norwegian has to say. As far as I'm concerned, this already affects my relationship with them. Because they're saying you can't get on unless you get vaccinated. You know, well, what if you can't get vaccinated for some reasons? Medically, you just don't, your doctor, by the way, I have no opinion on whether or not you should get vaccinated medically. I have no opinion on that. I have a problem with it being a political conversation. I have a big problem with vaccines being a political conversation. It should never be one. Now, if your doctor is making it a political conversation, I personally would find a different doctor. So my doctor's all like, well, you know, the Republicans feel this way. I'd be like, and I appreciate you being my doctor, but I'm going to find another one now. It's true. So, because I don't want them convoluting any conversations and belief systems in their medical practice towards my well-being. I want it to be 100% by the science that we have, Mm -hmm. not the politics that people push. So I'm not gonna have some organization coerce me into getting something that I don't feel safe with as it is. Now, I'm not saying I do or don't feel safe personally, but I am saying that if I don't feel safe because I don't, there's not enough time, there's catch-alls, there's the, um, the exemption that was done by Warp Speed which is the medical exemption that was afforded by President Trump, uh, who did do warp speed, not Biden, for those idiots out there that actually do think Biden did that. That is True. absolute, just gaslit to the, the absolute biggest extent. But anyway, so they are not held liable for any damages that are done to the persons that actually have uh, medical um, reactions to the shoot, to the old goof, uh, to the, the old jab. We gotta be careful with certain words, by the way. So I'm trying to figure the right ones out and not get us flagged or removed. So yeah, it's a good yeah. point. It should be between you and your doctor, absolutely. If there's a medical reason why you should receive the vac- vaccine, then do it. If you want to get it, do it. If you don't, don't. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, this is what should be going on the television, Chad. It, it, but we're not seeing that. This is no. this is the kind of conversations that people should be having, and it's it's all based upon choice. There should be no. Political influences, and part of the reason why we created the show, I guess, is, you know, Chad and I felt that there was so much political influence on so many different factors in our lives that mm-hmm. you know, I love your your uh, your articulation of the, you know, the doctors saying, oh, Republicans feel this way or, oh, Democrats feel this way. It should never be a po- political uh, politics has its area in our life and it has an area in our uh, existence. But there's some areas which should not come into play. You know, it shouldn't affect your practice. It shouldn't affect your business, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it's so. Yeah, it, it it just shows that a topic such as you know uh, the cruise lines. You know, people see on the news every day. Oh, Norwegian, you know, doing X and this, or you know, cruise lines having trouble set sail, and you just kind of brush it off. But it, it, there's big impacts to this kind of stuff, and you know, it's 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 cool to see 
other people's viewpoints. And, you know, my original thought point was I was looking at if I was the CEO of, of Norwegian, what would I want, right? And then my flip viewpoint was, okay, if I was, you know, uh, Ron DeSantis or if I was, you know, a, a, a Florida resident who was not about getting the vaccine, what would be my standpoint? This is always good, healthy things to do in your mind before you make a decision or before you develop an opinion on a certain topic, pretty much. Yeah. You know, we look at it too. It's like, okay, well, the economic impact of one, like a major cruise line like that, leaving the state of Florida. Well, it could, we could feel it as far as the state budget goes. All right. We could feel that if we see all of the cruise industry leave the state of Florida, we could feel that. But what does that say when somebody is standing in the way of their career interests to keep your constitutional rights? It's true. It's a good point. I mean, that's a, that's a big thing because it's next year. We are voting for who's the next governor of Florida. Is it going to be Ron DeSantis again, or is it going to be someone else? No. Uh, and he's putting himself on the altar. It's not that because Republicans support not getting vaxxed. No. It's getting involved in a polarizing conversation that could end up costing him votes. And he doesn't care. Yep. Constitution comes first. I'm a constitutionalist. That is what makes the United States great. We need to preserve it. Oh, it gets under my skin when people are advocates for losing the Constitution because they don't realize what they're going to give up in the bigger scheme of things. So it's a big thing, right? You have the position where people are like, well, it's public health, public, you know, public safety and all of this. If you want to wear two uh, masks, wear two masks. But if you're going to go and say, Chad, you need to wear two masks, I'm going to tell you to fuck right off. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to tell you to fuck off because it's a political position. It's a thought out position on my behalf of looking at everything as far as evidence goes and going, you are a sheep and I am damn sure not going to let you tell me how to live my life because you're a fear porn addict. So I'm not into that shit. I'm not into fear porn. I don't like it. Uh, I couldn't, I, I grew up watching Faces of Death. You no, know, if you haven't watched that, by the way, it's a movie to look into. It was something back in the day before you actually had like, you know, the grotesque websites that people get into now. So, but point is, I want to understand the situation and I damn sure don't want somebody to tell me how to think. Because when somebody's telling me how to think, I look for why. Is it just because they need more people to make them feel better about their decision? Or is it that they have another agenda? No, that's pretty much it. And I, I don't want to go on too long about this subject, but that's where I stand with it. It's we have too much politics involved with medical of uh, the medical situation right now. Mm -hmm. Way too much. And in my opinion, I think a lot of this would have went away just like swine flu did. Because swine flu didn't go away completely. Mm -hmm. It just went into a seasonal reaction where it wasn't so bad and people were just getting sick and it wasn't hysteria because the media didn't turn it into that. It's so. a great play into our next topic, Chad, because the next, my next topic is, again, we're going to keep it local for you guys tonight, uh, but that's the, the, that's Red Tide. And this is, I think, a position that Chad and I will have very, you know, agreeable, you know, viewpoints on. And that's, you know, a lot, especially the, the city, you know, um, you know, Chad and I live in an area where uh, Red Tide is really affecting us. And you're, you're, there's certain cities, as far as St. Petersburg, is wanting uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor, to declare a state of emergency uh, for the red tide. And again, just to make sure everyone knows, all declaring a state of emergency means is that emergency funds are going to be able to be reallocated to solve the problem. And I really like our governor's standpoint on, you know, red tide, yes, it does affect a lot of things. And yes, there's been a lot of politicians both red and blue that have done a lot of fuck ups as far as handling the red tide and how we can you know fix this problem but they're wanting him to declare a state of emergency so more funds can be allocated as far as cleanup goes and uh we we have the money we, we have the money to fix the problem as it is now we don't need to declare a state of emergency and yes businesses are suffering along the coast and along the shorelines where red tide is there and this mm -hmm. is a problem that definitely does need to be addressed 
as far as economic impacts on our country. If red tide continues, and this is a seasonal thing that continues to exacerbate and gets worse, then you're going to see a whole multitude of, of economic and, and tourism dollars not come to the state just solely based on the red tide issue. But at the same time, you know, to Chad's point, we don't need to make this a political thing because right. fixing the problem is we have the money to fix the problem, but declaring a state of emergency is more of a political standpoint to say, hey, we are in a crisis situation, which in my opinion just is trying to make the state of Florida look bad and the governor Ron DeSantis look bad. Uh, that's, that is exactly what it is. It's a hit job. They want the state of Florida to not be a flip state or a, a um, what is that? A swing state. They want it, yeah, swing state. Thank you. They want it to be a Democrat state. No, that's a political move because Ron DeSantis has made sure that we have voter integrity. We He's made sure that the people, the citizens of, of Florida actually keep their constitutional rights. And the Democrats from, and again, so that we say this every damn time, just like when we talk about crypto, we're not financial advisors, all that. I am a non-party affiliate. To make sure that's really clear for everybody, I do not have a party affiliation. I am not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. I have liberal views in the world. I have conservative views and I am more moderate than I am anything. I, depending on the subject, sometimes I'm far more conservative and sometimes more liberal. All of that being said, now that it's a freaking disclaimer because people are like, oh, it's another Republican talking bullshit. No, I'm a center aisle. I'm looking on both sides and I'm going, Jesus Christ, these people are lying. And they're lying on national television and in front of Congress, and nobody does anything about it. And this person did lie, but look at what they did to them. You know, that person lost their seat or they lost something. They then it's but this person barely lied, and this person committed treason. Oh, you know, and that person got away with it. And this one over here is likely never to get a job in politics again because the media is running through the freaking ringer. So with that. I'm recording, honey. That's Athena when she wants in. She does a little scratch. She's probably like therapy dog right now. Calm down, daddy. Um, so Some with scratch. all that being said, it is absolutely insane to the level of hypocrisy. And I swear, if I had unlimited resources, I would just go out and just, I would spend all day, every day. Well, maybe not all day, every day, because then I'd have no life, right? But I would spend an exorbitant amount of time researching the actual truths of everything. And I would do something similar to what Trump did at his rallies, where he just put the bullshit on the big screen behind him and let it play and the lies, the direct hypocrisy, and just let it go and not have a party affiliation. I like Ron DeSantis. I'm voting for him. That's it. Simple. So here's the things you're not going to hear about it, because what they're going to do is like, oh, we need a state of emergency for red tide. Contributing factors to red tide. Red tide is caused by an algae bloom that suffocates wildlife and irritates their system, their respiratory systems. Uh, so it, it suffocates them. So you have everything in the water that can die from red tide. That's why when you get around red tide, you'll notice that it's your breathing is a little more agitated. So you can there's a sensation you get from it. Okay. One of the things that contribute to that algae is some of that is like, you know, fertilizer runoff. That actually contributes to it. Um, sewage that's running into the system from a bit of overwhelmed and we haven't built out more sewage treatment so that we don't have that stuff getting out into the bay. So here's something that most people don't know about. I didn't know about it until recently either. Back in 2001, there was a plant that was owned by Mulberry Corporation, and it was at Piney Point. It's a Piney Point fertilizer plant that was abandoned by this corporation. It was, again, it's a fertilizer plant. That's they, so they use these big retention tanks to help create the fertilizer. Well, the byproduct of that is something that actually feeds this algae. They abandoned these massive tanks and the they sent people in, I believe it was the Army Corps, uh, Corps of Engineers went in. And again, I believe that's who it was. They went in and assessed it and figured, well, we could have a catastrophic issue where it just blows out or we could dump this into the, uh, into the bay and let it 
kind of dilute itself into oblivion. Problem was that it did not uh, dilute itself into oblivion. It helped. It, it helps foster this algae. There's also the sewage water that's uh, these gallon, these millions of gallons of sewage water that's dumped into the bay because we don't have enough treatment plants to handle it all. So we need to actually, because of the rising population, we need to be able to treat this stuff as well. And those are more things that actually affect this algae bloom. So by the way, that plant was abandoned in 2001. It's not a DeSantis problem. No, hell no. That's a, you have a mega corporation that they left that plant where it is. According to the articles I was reading, now it's the middle class. It's the small to mid-sized business owners that's paying for it. They got away with making that call. By the way, people, there are people that are saying, well, the Republicans stand for the big businesses. I'm sorry. Um, what is, what's Be uh, Bezos? Is he a Republican? He's the largest company, the financial empire in the world. And he's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of mega companies that are very Democrat. And, so, and just to prove your point, Chad, Rick Scott, Republican, he fucked a lot of this up. It shows a lot of rhinos out there. A lot of people that say they're Republicans, but so it, it just reiterates the point that the people you put in office are super important, no matter what political party they claim to be. So yeah, go ahead, Chad. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Oh, not a big Rick Scott fan, to be honest with you. No, I'm not either. I, I really... And I was not politically active when he was in. I just, I read about and heard about a lot of his dealings in the medical facilities and how he enriched himself through his own policies and, and his roles with those uh, facilities. Uh, actually, one of my ex, she was threatened because she was auditing some of these facilities and these medical facilities working for a very large company. And um, when she presented the, uh, the audit results, they're like, yeah, we're gonna have to change those. She's like, I'm not changing them. What are you talking about? This is what it is. Like, yeah, you're going to need to change that. So it pretty much told her that actually she lost her job because of it. No, they, they, yeah. So with that, I'm no, no fan. I'm not saying this Rick Scott, but I'm not saying that Rick, I'm not saying that Rick Scott created those things. It's true. It's true. But doesn't mean that he did not enrich himself through what was already there and, and not do something about it. So no fan there, no fan of Chris. You know, Charlie Crist also no favor here. Uh, um, I just don't, yeah. They flip flop and Charlie Crist. He's an independent now. He's a Republican. <laughs> he was a Democrat. I'm okay with you change parties. I really am. But change it for the right reasons, not just because you run out of the ticket. Now you got to get another one in order to try to get elected again. You didn't get, you lost it because of reasons, you know, and there's corruption and all of it. It's a whole nother episode. But no, it's a good point. Um, red tide is really bad right now. It's, you know, it's all over. Um, it's, you know, it's made it, you know, right in my backyard. I don't, I'm not live on the water, but I mean, backyard in my area. So, but yeah, hopefully we, uh, we do something about it. You know, could you imagine though, if DeSantis just like, all right. And then he just sends a task force out and they fix it. Yeah. It's a like, simple just, term. yeah. It just allocates it and just says, all right, let's do it. And it's over. And then they can't use that against him when they try to do this uh, political hit job on him in 2022. They probably will. He'll just go and fix it. And that's the thing. People in the media see, oh, Ron DeSantis is not declaring a state of emergency. Dive into what that means. Yes. Not just it, it, it's, it's allocation of funds is, is the predominant. You know, it, it, it's the predominant meaning of what that means is that more funds, emergency funds are available to fix this problem. And in, in my personal opinion, Ron DeSantis is looking out for its taxpayers and its citizens to say, hey, citizens of Florida, we don't need to dive into that emergency funds to fix this problem because we have the money to do so. Let's yeah. say we dive into those funds and a hurricane, God forbid, hits this state and we need those emergency funds. Guess what? They're not going to be there because they were used on a very minuscule problem that not many school to say that red tide is not a problem, but to say that the funds we have right now are not uh, uh, able to fix the problem that we are currently going through. So that, that's that's the mindset you have to look at, you know, from a complete, you know, nonpartisan standpoint. Listen, do we have the money to fix the problem? Yes. Then let's fix it. We don't need to. If, if, if you have if you have two thousand dollars in your checking account 
and you need to spend $100, do you need to pull from your savings account to fix that problem? Hell no. Think of it from that standpoint. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Oh, and I think that's an excellent point. The emergency fund is specific. And if people think, well, we'll just get federal money. No, we won't. No, we won't. We've already had federal money pulled back and sent over to California because Ron DeSantis would not play Joe Biden's ball game. So, yeah, we've got a governor that acts like a president should act. So, yeah, they're just going to do what they can. And this is also the way that it play out based on the media. Let's say he does get into the emergency fund. The media would just come out and say, well, the only reason why he did it is because of pressure for the Democrats. It doesn't matter. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't when it comes to the media. I recognize that mainstream media, I don't give a damn which channel it is. And, and yes, I'm throwing Fox in there again as well. Oh, it's all yeah. propaganda. It is unbelievable. I'm not saying absolute 100% propaganda. I don't know any left channels that aren't trying to just throw a bunch of propaganda out. But I will say maybe Tucker Carlson isn't so much for it. But the rest of them, I can't name one of them that is not a lying sack of shit. I can't name any of them. If they people like are. Rachel Maddow, I'll be like, you're an idiot. They all are. Well, Anderson Cooper, you're an idiot. No, you, you know what? Let me take it back. You're not an idiot. You enjoy being lied to. He's, he's one of my most hated people. I love how he sits. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to tangent too far. On Anderson Cooper. <laughs> you're not going to pull a Chad? <laughs> he's, he's a Vanderbilt, for God's sakes. And you're going to sit here and tell me, you're going to sit here and tell how the middle to lower class, the blue collar citizens of this nation should live. Get the fuck out of here. Sorry. Yeah. Feet don't touch the ground for that guy, right? God. No. So anyway, all right. There's so much that we could talk about. Um, we're not going to belabor you guys too much longer on the show today. Uh, but just know, one, I could be wrong. Absolutely could be wrong. I prefer the scientific method, and I am not going to be, well, 99% of the – no. Because you know what? Sometimes that 1% is right and 99% is going with it. They're just going with whatever the hell somebody else has already said. And let's face it, a lot of people in politics like to mislead or deceive people. I am no fan of it. And that's why I go from having that more spiritual behavior earlier in the show and outlook and thinking process to being obviously affected. And the reason why I'm obviously affected is I hate corruption. I hate this deception that I see regularly. And then the conversations and how it, it talk about misinformation. It, it doesn't, it doesn't educate people. And I'm caught, I don't like the, the word de-educate. Uh, or miseducate is probably a little bit better, but it's propagandizing. I refer to that as being a pig, right? Propagandist, informed, groupie. Because those are the people that really like it. No, doesn't mean that they like it because they know that it's wrong. They just really like it because it's everybody else has joined in it. The way I look at it right now is the majority of people that I come across that are like the Democrat side of things, predominantly again center i i'm i'm a non-party guy but the way i see it is back in high school where you'd have the cool group of kids that they just told you what to think and then the other kids are like i want to be cool so i'm going to think what they think and That's before you know it it's like they're ready to go out and mob people without even knowing a damn thing about what happened well i'm gonna go kick his ass just because, you know what? I really like her and, and it's wrong what he did to her. And it, she's puppeteering it, you know? Or maybe not. Maybe the two of them just don't understand it. And she doesn't have the calculated approach to think things through. The emotional body got a hold of the, the rational side and put it into, you know, a choke out and the emotional side won. And now you want to just go and beat somebody up because you don't even know what the hell's going on because other people are doing it. It's mob think mentality. It's a dangerous place to be. Uh, and a lot of the people that are on that side are the ones who are like, I'm a critical thinker. Oh, I'm, I'm smart and I prefer information. I prefer to be educated. And 
then you find out that they're educated by the media. Like, congratulations, you're part of the problem. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not blaming individuals on this necessarily. I'm saying wake up. And that's what we're trying to do is to wake people up. So if you are finding yourself offended, that could be a good compass to recognize that I'm actually not saying you by your name. Hey, stop. <laughs> Pop is in the middle of something. <laughs> yeah, it's going to rain here in just a second. And they do not like that. Um, so what I'm saying though, is that we need to break free of this and, and not talking about you as an individual. If you feel like I'm attacking you, that could be a damn good compass that you're in defense mode because of an ideology that you yourself likely did not create, but you accepted somebody else taught it to you. So, all right. Enough tangents by me, my man. Joshua, I apologize. What's that? It was a good episode. We talked on a lot of, you know, things that were, you know, in the mainstream media that people probably didn't see certain sides to. And, and at least for, I, I feel most of our viewers that are in the Florida, you know, that, that live in the state of Florida can relate to in a lot of different ways. So I hope that created a good little uh, spin. I'm sure you'll see more of Alan Watts. Of course, we always talk about Florida. You know, if you, how can you not talk about the best state in the United States? So yeah, I enjoyed it, Chad. It, it, it's, it's, and you know, and here's the beautiful part is that it's okay to disagree on things, people. That's what you need to understand. That's what life's all about. Imagine if everyone saw the exact same thing, the exact same way and lived the exact same life and did the exact same thing. It would be like we're little robots. We might as well just, you might as well just put me in like a little robot body and I'll just walk around and do what everyone else does. That's, that's not what it's about. And as much as mainstream media wants to tell you that that's what it's about, it's not about that at all. But it is up to each individual to control their emotions and control their ego, which is something we'll talk about later on, that you have to make sure you critical think to the point to where, am I correct? What are this person's viewpoint? What are their facts? What are my facts? And then you can come to the best you know, decision you can as far as what you think is incorrect and correct. Yeah, you know, what a great place to stop you know, to end the show because it, it ties us back around, as I mentioned earlier about rigid thinking and how that stresses people out. If you want to truly be free, you have to identify where you've been manipulated. And some of that's you, you're manipulating yourself because of past experiences. Fastest way to get people to change course and do what you want them to do, put them under extreme pressure, stress, exhaust them, put them in a painful situation that need to be physically painful. Cognitive dissidence is a painful situation. Uh, and the other sides too, like the promises of joy and pleasure and things like that are other ways of manipulating people. So if you feel like you've been moved in any which direction throughout this episode, ask yourself if that be the case for you. No, because our job waking people up, this is what we mean. We're waking you up to a consciousness. No, we're bringing you to a new level of thinking or at least an, a more open, independent way of thinking. So yeah, check him out, Alan Watts. Also, check out my good man, Joshua McClendon, the man that even Prince would sing about. Your patriot, Mike Kraken. He's got a little Instagram, plays with his dog on it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, he's a, a, a treasure to the show. So it was great having you back, my man. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, guys, if you have not yet, please hit that subscribe button. Please share, comment. I uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Have a great weekend. If you are working this weekend, keep grinding your weekend is only what you make it. And above all else, Chad, just stay golden for me, boy. And just keep pushing, <laughs> keep that chin down, and we'll be back with another episode very soon. Uh, I missed you guys a lot, so I'm, I'm very happy to be back. Yeah. yeah. Well, remember, we're Americans. We need to act like it. We're all in this together. So until next time, keep on trucking. I don't know. I'll come up with a better tagline at some point in time. So, <laughs> all right. Well, let's get back to our regularly scheduled broadcast of just whatever the hell it is we want to do. So other than this, we, we love doing this. All right. That's it. See you guys. <laughs>